morning everybody. Well, thanks for inviting me here. It's very pleased to come uh, uh, even, even more pleased to come in a country which is nearby my original one because I have several hands on my head. Uh, the original one is Greek as you can realize by the name. Uh, now, what I will uh, what I will talk about uh, is a general introduction about uh, uh, this concept of policy analytics. No, and why that? Because the term analytics is inflated around us. It is used for about every purpose. No, and. Uh, the idea is to try to give you a definition. I don't, I don't think so. If people can hear me, it's easier for me to talk without these sticks. Uh, no. Now, it is also, I have to be sincere, the term policy analytics, it, is, it has been invented also for, let's say, advertising purposes. No? Helping to make better decisions it has been the case since the 40s, the 50s, so it's not something really new. It is new the way through we do it today, and there are some things we need to consider specifically by the way we do it today, no? And that's the reason for which we adopt this term, no? But there are several things that have been done since a long time, no? Okay, so let me, uh, uh, by the way, in order to understand I am the head of this center in the uh, uh, which is LAMSAT, which stands of Laboratoire uh, d'Analyse et Modélisation des Systèmes d'Etat la Décision. So it is a center, it's a computer science center, but dedicated in how to help people improving decision making. Okay? So we do basic research in decision making. No? Okay. So let's try to, uh, uh, to see what I will talk about. I will try to explain why we did this uh, term. Uh, I will try to specify why policy making is not a, has specificities as a decision making process and what this make it special for decision support. Then I will try to make the difference between analytics and policy making. Okay. Um, what do we observe around us? First of all, there is an increasing demand no, for supporting the design, implementation, and evaluation of public policies. This increase of demand it is coincides also with an increase of offer. Why this happened? Most of the players in the service industry realize that the part of market in which they can really increase their business is the public sector. Companies like IBM, Google, uh, LinkedIn, uh, all these big players know that the market of helping the public uh, utilities, etc., etc., is not covered. So there is big money to do that. No? And this is why they invest massively no, in this area. Consider that IBM, for instance, hired in three years 100 researchers for the Smarter Cities Center they have in Dublin. No? This is uncomparable with any university investment done in Europe in uh, the last 10 years. No? So there is, in, there is a lot of interest. No? Now, there is a specific demand of innovating uh, the design of public policies. <coughs> no? uh, and we'll, I will try to be more precise later on, on what I mean with this term. No? On the other hand, there is too much information no? for which we don't know what the quality is. No? And it's not only the matter of social media, for instance. No? for which there are people who have absolutely no uh, qualification 
because they have a blogger, they become opinion makers. Why? No? But it's not only that. Consider, for instance, the networks of sensors, no? which are deployed massively around us by citizens for measuring whatever. No? So there is a lot of data information around us, but we don't know what these data mean, really. Okay? In the past, there has been a, a, a stronger, let's say, commitment in the 90s, no? in what the, we call um, evidence-based policy making. No? Uh, the new public management has, has been ideas uh, by the Blair government. No? Well, basically they failed no? to become, what I mean they failed, to become a paradigm of how policy making should be designed. No? It's not that they fail generally. No? But they are not, they fail to become a paradigm. No? <coughs> and uh, the last thing uh, is uh, that we need to focus uh, the supporting governance not only when uh, something is chosen, but on the whole policy side. Our colleague this morning already introduced this idea of what's a policy cycle. No? Supporting no, the establishment of policies concerning the whole side. No? Okay, let's now try to understand to what we have to pay attention. No? First of all, first of no, first observation, do numbers provide evidence? No? Let's see the example I have there. No? Suppose that you want to rank candidates university departments, applicants, whatever, no? So you have a list of candidates and there are two attributes in which you measure something. doesn't matter what it is exactly, no? How do you merge these ones in order to rank the candidates? What people several times do is that they transform that to a common scale of 100, no? They fix the highest to 100, so they transform the rest, they average and you get a rank. It looks pretty straightforward, isn't it? No? Actually, it's very widely adopted as a technique. Now, see what happens. Imagine that the first candidate, who knows who is the best, he wants to strengthen this position, so he puts more effort and improves. Okay? Since he is the best and improved, apparently nothing should happen. But this is not the case. The rank has been completely inversed. So the other ones did nothing. I improved my position as the best and I inverted completely the rank. But it's even worse. No? Consider that while no, I was while the first one was improving, the second one also was improving. Well, he still is doing very bad. Instead of being second, he's now the eighth. No? It's tricky, isn't it? No? Why it happens? Uh, well, a student in decision theory can tell you why this happens. No? Because in this case, you play with the numbers, no? without paying any attention to what the number mean, no? Now, of course, if you do it because you want to play with the numbers, this is possible. But what happens if this one is used to make a policy? And if you don't believe it makes a policy, this is how the Shanghai Index is constructed. The example, no, is taken from a paper done by colleagues of my department, no? which shows why the Shanghai Index is meaningless. No? Because it is used using a play of the numbers which is simply meaningless. No? It is as if I say that I will measure the cleverness of the candidates by average the color of the, uh, the hair and the color of their eyes. No? That was the Shanghai Index test. 
when there are billions of dollars that are decided because universities have to improve their ranking on a meaningless index. No. In France, they have been distributed billions of euros because of that. No. Now, this is what a meaning, meaningless no, policy means. No. Let's go ahead. Let's take another example. No. A little bit more uh, complicated. No. Uh, I don't know how many of you know how the air quality is measured. No. In several countries, they use an index which is used also in France, no? which is the following one. There are four pollutants, no? which are the four, the four you see here. No? These are measured on a physical scale, and that physical scale, which is concentration on metric cube, no? is transformed on a regular scale, which goes from one, which is good, to ten, which is bad. Okay? No? So, for instance, you have a location, you have a sensor that makes these measurements, and then at time one, this is the measures you have on the four pollutants. What's the quality of the index? What is the worst of the four? Which means that the quality in T1 is 8. Okay? Now, before I show you what happens, no? consider the following one. The rationale for which the pollution is measured this way is that originally it has been conceived as a way to make an alert. In case one of the pollutants no, goes beyond a certain threshold, no, we make an alert to the population so that elder people, children, babies, or whatever, no, will stay in a house and things like that. No? So this is why, no, it is completely reasonable to say that, no, that we will use as a measure of the pollution the worst of the fall. No? Now imagine the situation the following one. There is a major no, that makes an effort, investing money, in improving the quality of the air in his town. No? And he gets this as a result. No? Their quality did not improve for the index. No? Instead, another one, same location, our policy obtains this as a result. Well, this is done better. It doesn't look very intuitive, isn't it? No? Because the third one looks as it has been better than that one. But it's not the case. Independently that what the index says, eh, we realize that this one is a better effort than that one. No? What does it mean? It means that an index that has been constructed for being used as an alert eh, is not useful for measuring an effort of a town no, as investment for a public policy. So we cannot use whatever index for whatever purpose. No? Even if it's even if it is a meaningful manipulation, because taking the max of this one is completely meaningful. No? It doesn't mean that gives a result which makes a sense. It makes a sense sometimes, and it doesn't make sense in other cases. Okay? Now let's go to the last uh, my last uh, let's say uh, observation. We often claim that uh, having a majority, no, it is something that uh, is sufficient to make a decision. No? Is it always the case? No? Imagine a referendum in France, no, uh, let's say six months after the Bataclan, no? About the death penalty. The majority will be for reintroducing the death penalty. Is this sufficient to make legitimate the decision about death penalty? The fact that the majority wants it. 
Indeed, no body in France has the courage to say that. No? And myself, I will be against something like that. No? But indeed, the majority will be for reintroducing the death penalty. So there is a difference between having a majority for something and something which is legitimate to be introduced as a policy. It's not exactly the same thing. No? By the way, there are several majorities. There are several different ways to compute a majority. There is a theorem that tells you that there are manipulable majorities, that there are different ways to make a majority, and also which majority and how this is computed, no, and things like that. No? So, uh, the concept of majority, no, although it is extremely important for a democratic society, is not necessarily a concept sufficient for making a decision. Not considering the fact that innovation, new things, comes from minorities. All big ideas came from somebody who has been the first alone to think about it. At the end of the story, he had reason. But at the time he did that, he was a miserable minority. No? So we have to pay attention no, on what does it mean something which legitimates decisions. Okay? Now, what does it policy making, what's special in policy making? No? With respect to other decision making processes. No? Uh, why am I asking that? Because if there is something special, our methodology on supporting decisions should be special. Okay? Now, what's the public policy? I will use the definition of which comes from my domain. I am uh, I'm a operational researcher, I am a decision theorist. No? So for me, a policy no, is an agreement no, which allocates resources to objectives. No? Now, what it is important to notice is that this agreement which allocates resources generates inclusion and exclusion. No, because it gives rights to some part of the population and denies rights to other part of the population. So automatically generates inclusion and exclusion. Are you, do you mean rights in the narrow sense or would they also be resources? Resources, rights. It's a very broad sense. It's a very broad sense. But in any case, there are people that are subjects of the policy and other ones which are not, which means inclusion and exclusion. It can have positive and negative meanings, inclusion and exclusion. Doesn't mean automatically excluding something being negative, but it is the case, okay? Now, uh, the other thing we have to pay attention is that policies no, are conceived, designed, implemented, monitored, evaluated, etc., etc., on a side, no? Uh, I suppose you cannot read, read it, but uh, this morning the policy cycle was much easier to understand. It's, it's the same thing. There are no uh, big uh, differences. Okay? Now, what makes public policy making special? First of all, is the time horizon. Public policies are aimed to have a very long time horizon. No? It could span over generations. No? Uh, deciding where to store, let's say, nuclear waste, it's something that lasts tens of generations. <coughs> no? And if you consider investments on, let's say, building bridges, there are bridges that have been constructed by the Romans that are still there. No? And it takes some thousands of years since they did that. Okay? Now, the other thing is the use of public resources. No? Now, I'm using the, the term public resources 
for people that are more acquainted with the Commons literature, Ostrom's uh, theory, no, that's the whole thing about using the Commons. No, so in public policy, we we use also very specific classical resources, but we also use and manage Commons. The consequence is that these processes are de facto participative. No. It doesn't mean that they are officially participative. De facto, if a public policy is using one cent of my taxes, I am in principle allowed to tell my opinion about them. Because it used my money. No? Now this reasoning, of course I don't do it every day, but the, 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 the nearest the policy to my uh, interests, the more is likely that I will feel involved in that and I will try to influence. You know? And the souther you go in the world, the more this happens. You know? uh, now, another specificity are two, let's say, orthogonal uh, requirements. One is about accountability. Public policy making needs to be accountable. But that is not necessarily convergent with creating legitimation. No? Because the accountability is something you look every day. No? In trying to be accountable, you may completely lose no, the creation of long-term legitimate action. No? But the both are necessary. No? And the last thing is deliberation. Public policies are deliberated. There is a moment in which they are announced, they are delivering. Now, now if these uh, are the specificities of, let's say, public policy making, in front of that, the instruments we have are pretty traditional. No? What do we have? We have statistics. No? We have performance indicators. I mean, with more elaborated uh, statistics. We have data mining, we have knowledge extraction, we have machine learning, no? But we have nothing which is specially geared for the special purposes I was talking about, no? So these things are certainly useful. I mean, we will, if we want to help people make decisions, no? We will use statistics, that's for sure, no? The problem is not the fact that we use statistics, it's how we use statistics. And what sense we are going to create out of observing statistics and how this can be done in the case of uh, public policy making. No? Let me make an example. No? Suppose that you are observing the real estate market no? because you want to make a policy about urban quality. No? The question you have to ask is the real estate market a correct predictor of the quality of the town? In the sense, are the districts with the highest value on the real estate market the ones that people love to live? It's not always the case. No? If it's not the case, we cannot use the value observed in the market as a predictor of what the quality of the town is. No? We have to elaborate further on the values that are behind. No? And what's the use of the town that people want to make. No? So that means that uh, uh, we need to learn about the values of the people that use the city. And not about the market values the city take, no? which is biased by the necessities of the real estate market. The values of the real estate market are not necessarily the values of the users of the town, no? which means that we have to distinguish between the values of the clients of the market, of the society, the legitimated values, no? Now, that means that we need to learn values, no? You will see Paolo later on that we'll talk about preference learning, 
no? Which is a precise way to address how do we learn values, no? And how do we explain values? How do we argue about these values? <clears throat> okay, let me try to summarize. If we want to help, uh, let's say, improving policy making, our job is to provide knowledge, is to provide information. No? This is what is expected by us, no? either as scientists or as consultants. Okay. What should characterize the knowledge we produce? No? My claim is that it should be characterized by three, uh, let's say, uh, features. One is meaningfulness. You cannot play with the numbers as they play with the Shanghai index. No? So please uh, no, remember, we can do whatever, no? But there are principles in measurement theory, in decision theory. We cannot manipulate no, data and numbers in, as a chocolate. No? So we need to produce meaningful knowledge, no? uh, respecting elementary principles. It's not really that complicated. No? <clears throat> because that makes really, uh, let's say, transparent the discussion about what we use in order to make uh, decisions. So the first thing is meaningfulness. The second one is legitimate knowledge. No? Because having only meaningful knowledge is necessary, but it's not sufficient. No? What I mean by legitimate knowledge? No? It means something that will fit the legitimation requirements of the process for which the information is going to be used. Let me give another very simple example. No? In my scientific life, it happened that I have been PI of projects funded by NSF in the States. No? As such, I receive every year a very simple questionnaire no? in which I have to say if I am, what's my race? If I am really, if I am black, Hispanic, uh, white, or I remember what are the three or four, uh, no? And if I remember well, what's my religion, no? Now, I, I mean, personally, I don't care, no? Uh, I suppose that NSF has several good reasons for doing that, no? But in Europe, this should be strictly forbidden, an inquiry of this type. Any Russian statistic in Europe is strictly forbidden. Although it might be interesting to have it. No? I will not discuss whether it is interesting information. It is simply not legitimate. No? Why? Because for several reasons you cannot use that in Europe. No? So we need to create and manipulate legitimate information. Why that? Because if we have to argue, you see, most of the work in decision support consists in creating arguments, in convincing. No? If we need to convince and argue, this needs to be impeccable. So we cannot be in front of the case in which they will tell us, well, it's fine, but the information you are using cannot be used in this case. And then it has to be useful, practically useful, in the sense that it has to fit the requirements, the problem for which it has been asked. No? And when I say useful, I also think in terms of uh, policy cycle, of life cycle of the information. No? When, you, when you create information, no? And mostly when you create information which is summarizing, no, under form, let's say, of an index, of an indicator, of something, no, this is not only an observation of a reality, it also 
induces a behavior. No? For instance, if I start measuring the quality of research using the age index, no? what practically it means? It means that in 10 years from now, 15 years from now, all researchers will adapt their publishing policy to how quality is measured by the age index. Which means that in 20 years from now, no, the age index will discriminate absolutely nothing. You see, if uh, maids consider that the standard of women beauty is blonder, in 30 years, all women will be blonder. We destroyed by university. No? And will no, but it, it will not work anymore, discriminate by the color of the hair. So it's the same thing. When you create something which is useful, it needs to be discriminatory. It needs to be able to uh, understand, to discriminate what you observe. Okay? Now, why do we want to do that? No? Because we want to it's not only because we want to improve how decision is done in the case of public policies, but it is also because we want to improve the design of public policies. No? How? Thinking about unconceivable policies until today. No? And I just give some very simple examples again. No? Consider a law. A law typically introduce a dichotomy, the ones which are lawful and the rest, the ones that do not respect the law. No? Fine, this is the principle of, of lawmaking. No? But then what about making a law which is not only a dichotomy, that for instance has a positive policy for the ones that do more than what the law asks. How do we measure that? What this will mean? No? Today we have possibilities to do and conceive actions on this side. No? You can also make personalized taxation schemes. So instead of having a general taxation policy, I could make a taxation policy which is individualized. It is possible to do that. And perhaps that will improve the way through which we collect taxes. No? We can design socially responsible algorithms. The last talk, no, gave us a lot of interesting hints, no, of what does it mean, no, uh, conceiving algorithms, how these are trained, uh, uh, auditing algorithms, no? So we can think about designing socially responsible algorithms which are everywhere now among us. No? And there are several other topics of this time. No? Now, I don't want to bother you. Uh, uh, in a paper I published some years ago, uh, two or three years ago, there is a comparison that summarizes no, the difference what would be business analytics and what would be policy analytics. No? So the main uh, uh, message I want to deliver is that these are indeed two different areas, no? and it means that we need, to a large extent, create a methodology of in decision sciences which gears, which is geared, which fits the requirements of supporting public policy. No? So let me conclude. Using evidence, constructing evidence, the all the traditional evidence, statistics, etc., is necessary. No? What I am talking about is not forgetting making statistics. The contrary. The fact is that something which is necessary is not sufficient. No? The second message is that decisions are not in the data, are in the values. And this is why evidence is necessary but is not sufficient. It's not sufficient having only the data rich data, elaborated, etc., etc. We need to work on the values and the interpretation that goes upon them. 
which means we have to pay a lot of attention to the subjective nature of values. Values are not objective. Values are subjective, naturally subjective, because my values are not the values of Pablo's, because we are different. No? Uh, although we are both Greeks. No? You, you remark that despite being both Greeks, we have different values. No? So values are subjective. No? They are never objective. So they will never be in a policies that are objectively legitimated. Policies will always be subjectively legitimated. No? Which means that we have to work on that. It's not terrible. Actually, policies has always been subjectively defined, no? But we can work on see on doing that seriously, no? So we need to expand analytics in order to uh, uh, to adapt ourselves, no, to this type of requirements. And I am firmly convinced, no, that we have to do that with an ultimate objective of innovating the design of policies. We need to turn one day to become able to design policies that have not, that nobody ever thought about them. And it's not difficult to realize that it's not that difficult to create innovation. Thank you. We have already yes, is the other week of the company. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very interesting topic. Uh, I have a question which is, okay, maybe a little bit naive, but so if you have different people with different stakeholders with different values, then invariably, because you're going to do it in some computational way, you have to aggregate those values. Will we not be forced to then again introduce some reductionist metric of aggregating those if we don't want the society to fragment into different parts that follow different values, which will create again the same problems because we will lose some of the quantitative justifications, explanations, and arguments. Sure. Any aggregation results in reducing information, Redu results in a loss of information. No? Now, what is important is not how you aggregate is how you argue about the information. A policy is accepted, becomes legitimated, because the stakeholders accept it. No? And in order to accept it, you have to convince them. No? You see, having the majority in the parliament doesn't mean that you are legitimated to make a decision. Most clever policy makers around the world know that empirically and they will go to seek for legitimation beyond the majority in the parliament. They will seek it in the society, in the cultural environment, uh, social environment, negotiating with the trade unions, the uh, business patrons, etc. Et no? So in doing that, you need to use reasons. In creating the reasons, you also need to explain the reasons for which you aggregate the information in a certain way. So we need to remember that uh, saying that, uh, let's say, the majority of the population wants yellow flowers, no? Uh, it is fine, provided that we say what majority and why we use that type of majority for making the decision. Because that thing needs to be accepted. No? So at the end of the day, it will always be a matter of argumentation. No? And I open a parenthesis. One of the research lines we're trying to uh, uh, let's say work in is also that one. No? How to uh, let's say use formal argumentation theory coupled with this type of processes. No? It's not easy. Sincere, we're not, we're not very successful to be very sincere about that. But it is an open question. Perhaps there are people more clever than us that can find a way to do it. No? 
But uh, I am pretty convinced that this is one of the things we have to uh, uh, do. Well. So it's not that much a matter of choosing an aggregation procedure. It's justifying it. It's explaining it. Becoming it acceptable. You know? And then there are several reasons, positive and negative, that we have to put them but, but of course, nowadays we have the problem that the whole debate about this is uh, mediated by algorithms that yeah. aggregate the reasons, right? So, you know, like uh, on social media and so on. And yes, this is one of the reasons for which the idea of making socially responsible algorithms, you no, know, it becomes uh, important. You see, an algorithm, is, we don't have to see it necessarily as a software. No? An algorithm is a mechanism no, which allocates resources. We could use mechanism design theory, which actually what does is axiomatizing mechanisms to see whether we can introduce in the design of an algorithm concepts like monotonicity, fairness, uh, neutrality, no, which are typical axioms in mechanism design, and we never use in uh, designing algorithms. We design algorithms in terms of complexity, average, uh, worst case, etc., etc., which is a computing standard, but we don't use it for, we don't use it. So this is something that would become another uh, topic. Is it possible that stronger index uh, are being made uh, with all professionals? Uh, Please repeat that. Uh, you said that stronger index is, is meaningless. Uh, meaningless. Yes. Is it possible that such important indexes are be being made by uh, amateurs? So, well, it is the case. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you know the story. No, no. Uh, this has been a PhD that uh, the professor asked the two students to do something in which, you no, know, and what they did, and in, if you analyze it deeper, you no, know, you will see it. What they did is they collected what information is available on the web about universities, and they made a very trivial way to aggregate this information. You know? And what is interesting is that their university has been able to sell it. It's not that the two students did an exercise Badly, it is that their professors first did not realize that it is a badly done exercise, but they have been so clever to sell it worldwide. And of course, it is interesting to note that tens, hundreds of policymakers buy it. Okay. Thanks, Javier.